I'm very happy to be back in your beautiful living room. Oh, I'm happy to have you back. Yes, I even washed my hair. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to get into today's topic, which was um, a headline that came from um, Frances Donald, who is uh, Manulife's chief economist. Yeah, I think that's her. Yep. her official title. Brilliant, very highly educated, much smarter than myself, but came out with a really bold statement and um, definitely uh, worth talking about, which was that we will not see affordable housing for at least 10 years. She did a prediction on the next 10 years, taking all the pressure off. We know that housing prices in Canada will not come down and that, well, not even not come down, but that they will stay unaffordable, which... I don't necessarily want to get into the qualifying of what's affordable and not affordable, but um, Bloomberg did break down what that meant and how that could happen. Right. Which um, I really want to spend time getting into. Absolutely. So I, I think I've looked at different stats and like the whole what's affordable is a little bit of a finger in the air. It's well, based off of 2003, 2004 data in which it says no more than 40% of your income should be going to housing. Like where that's based out of, I won't get into, but there's a history of where that's based out of the U.S. and it wasn't really a analysis. It was kind of like a heuristic that people just developed just because. Right. And but, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I also remember my agent when I was buying my first house or with my husband and I, that actually stuck in my head. It's funny that you'd said that uh, now was that it was kind of like this real estate rule, like that one person's income almost went to oh yeah, the one mortgage person. Yeah, one person and the other, income. or 50% or 40% yeah. went to yeah. the rest of it. But not a household, price, 40 went into an individual. Right, oh, okay. So, but then, isn't that a little outdated considering how totally inflation outdated. has caused like gas prices and food prices and... Totally, totally outdated. So, but like, and... Let's dig into like she what she said and what Bloomberg said because I think it's really interesting to say okay if affordability is going to happen, one of these three things have to occur. And what was it? I know. So um, income mm -hmm. has to increase. So income your so the income of the average person would have to go up fifty five percent. So that sounds like pretty good news, right? Everybody would like to make fifty five percent more than they are now, but the real the reality is is that. Um, of the three things that could happen, That's that is the one that I do not believe I would put my money on the roulette table. So what is the background yes. in the last 23 years, you said? Yeah, the last 23 years. So income has increased 23 years by, I believe, well, I believe, I know, 22.72%. So for double amount of time for half. And of it's half. And, and I hear this from parents of clients of mine who are looking for houses, their new first house, and they say, my kids are making relatively the same amount of money that I was however many years ago, and then look at the housing prices. When I bought my first house, I'm going to age myself, but 30 years ago, it was, or no, maybe it was about 25 years ago, I bought my very first house, and I bought it for $164,000. That same house, it was a detached bungalow oh. at Marley and Eglinton in Midtown Toronto. So not where she kept it. Oh my God, right? <sighs> and You're tired. I know, I needed to sell it to buy my next house, right? I was getting married. I bought it all by myself. Yeah. And it had a shared driveway and I had a, I had a basement tenant to help me pay for it. And um, that house today would be worth a million dollars. Easily. I, I've watched it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not bitter. But no, I've watched it because I actually think it's a great little pocket also. But yeah, $900 million. So, I mean, we haven't seen incomes go up that much. No. You're not fine. You're barely seeing a single person buy a condo with me. And by the way, I couldn't afford a condo back then. I bought a house because I couldn't afford the maintenance fees. Ooh, that's another episode. I remember thinking about it and thinking, maybe I should buy, like I'm single, right? Like I'm, I just need a condo and I traveled for work at the time and I thought I don't, and, and no. So that's another conversation as to what's Can happening in the condo market. a house was cheaper? A house was cheaper? I mean, sometimes it is, 
but that's another episode. Yeah, it depends, yeah. right? Okay, so we're going so, on a tangent. Yeah, no, no, no. So 55%. So first is the I income of the average person must in go the, up 55%. In the, next, in the next 10 years. This is all to have housing be more affordable for the average person in Canada. Whereas okay. we know our status has only actually gone up in the last 23 years, 22%. Yeah, so that That's one's not happening. Not happening. Okay, the next one has to do with interest rates. So that, the interest rates would have to fall 350 basis points. Now, I would put my money more on this. So the, the markets have um, factored in, I think by the end of next year, somewhere around 200 basis points. Right, okay. So that makes more things possible. a lot more affordable for a lot of people. I do think prices are going to react to that, but you know, not to be a doomsdayer, but I do. Yeah, the whole drop in interest rates doesn't make sense to me because as soon as we do that, you pull that lever, then what ends up happening is a lot of demand comes in, um, given how much our population is growing and the fact that we're not building enough supply. I, I don't really see how that's going to work. It happens every single time interest rates go down, tons of buyers come in, not enough supply, simple economics, we've talked about it before, we see At prices nauseam, go up. Yeah. So, I, I don't really think that, that that particular slice of the of the three is going to work as well, unless the third piece happens in which we increase supply, right? Mm -hmm. And so I believe, how many homes did, was it quoted that they have to increase supply? Um, sorry, my handy dandy notes. Well, I can tell you from CMHC what they what we need from CMHC. They're asking, not asking, they're saying that we have to build close to 22 million homes by 2030 if we're going to be able to create some form of affordability. affordability. And that's, I see different data on this, two to 3.5 to even 5 million additional homes on top of what we're currently projected to build. None of it's happening. So that can't happen as well. However, I'm gonna make a bet. I think of all those things, oh, there's a third, I think- there, The third one was actually the drop in house prices. Yes, but I thought those things would cause the drop in house. No. That was, Bloomberg stated it, it, in, amongst other things, but of the three, oh, that's right. the third one was that house prices needed to fall 33%. Right, right. So we were talking about this off camera before we started. So I, so now, so you think the $2 million house now, um, if it's going to fall 33% is going to be, you know, now 1.4, let's even call 1.5. We saw that price drop. I did this exact formulation when we went from COVID, like the height of COVID, which was I think the February before the the rate started to increase to the lowest point in the market, which I think was like July of 2022, 23. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me. Anyway, bottom line was it was almost like a year over year comparison. Right. And the average detached house that Treb came out with in the height of money being free was I think something like $2.1 million. It was crazy, crazy. And if you did the same house after the rates had skyrocketed, mm -hmm. it fell to 1.6, like it fell. So the challenge that I have with these predictions, what would have to happen and why I'm not sure why she came out with this huge... Bold statement? Yeah, I don't know if it's maybe just to level set the market, to understand that like, you know what, take the pressure off, the next 10 years we know, like just keep calm and carry on. I don't know. But none of those three pillars either are gonna happen or would be a cause and effect. Right, so, so one thing that I start to get curious about is, okay, Clearly, this is a supply issue. Yes, um, we're going to be reducing the amount of um, immigrations that's going to be coming in. Cat's kind of already out of the bag on that particular issue, and we don't really accurately calculate how many people are really here. It's, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, it's not for, Foreign buyer's tax isn't really real. Um, you're allowed to buy in a lot of different areas. There's so many Lots exceptions. Lots of loopholes. Yeah. Tons of loopholes. That's not yeah. really real. So what's the only thing that we can actually do? And I think what we can actually do is build more if... I will stop right here. I'm going to tell you something that's super cool. Uh, I came across an article about a company in Sweden that is able to build the structure of a house in 30 minutes. The same structure takes 11 and a half months in Canada. How are they doing it? Modular building. 
Okay. So completely inside, kind of like a Toyota Volvo plant, mm -hmm. but here's where it makes it more interesting. So how can they actually do that? It's not just that they have the technology as in, it's really simple, by the way, it's within a, an actual plant. Mm -hmm. It's how the Swedish rules work, which are different from that of the US and Canada, in which Canada says, for fire rating to be approved, you need XYZ um, boarding, it has to be this thick, it's very prescriptive in what you can use. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Sweden, it's make it fireproof. You figure out the best way to do that. And then what you also do is you get all the work done ahead of time. So there isn't all this permitting. So when we, we did the renovations here, we got to wait for this permit to come through. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've got to stop everything and wait for that to happen. Whereas that's not the case in Sweden. You get all your approvals up front and you build right out. So it reduces the actual cost of stop and go, which is very costly. They must have more people working in the permit office than we do. <laughs> no, I bet you they don't. I just bet you they're more efficient. But nonetheless, and they actually, you know, use technology. Mm -hmm. but, not, but, not, but nonetheless, that, that aside, um, what I found super cool about that is that this whole concept actually grew out of the 19, 1950s and 60s in the U.S. It was a project called, and I have it written down, something about, They've hold been on, doing Operation you, Breakthrough. Have you in the U.S.? Yes, happened in the 1950s and 60s, and let's say the, the U.S. government, Romney, Mitt Romney's father said, why do we have back. like all of these small little zoning rules? Why don't we commoditize rules, like make one big national rule as to how to build? Right. So that means that we can get economies of scale up, blah, 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 blah. They actually rolled it out and it was wickedly successful, but costly because the government bankrolled the whole thing. Right. So they said, ah, we're done here. But what was learned from all of that is that if you have like standardization across the country, you can actually build a lot faster. Right. So that's never going to happen in Canada. So that's for my... sure. But they had, I mean, we've been doing modular. I, I feel like this is so many, there's so many layers to this. So, first of all, there's been modular homes being built in Canada for years. Right. Um, they're definitely faster, right? Because yeah. they're built, it's very similar to almost how they're doing kitchens. Like in the old days, I remember we did a kitchen reno and it was like they come, they tear your kitchen out, and then they start building it in your kitchen now. They build the kitchen, they tear your kitchen out, they come install the next day. It's much more, it, it, it's a definitely a better process, it's quicker. But I remember pricing it out for our cottage when we were going to build a cottage. Right. Modular versus um, build like traditionally was not much different in cost. I don't doubt that because we still haven't overcome the permitting issue, which doesn't allow full modular building like we do in Sweden. Quite literally, the whole thing is being painted all done within the actual um, within the, within the actual factory. So for example, okay, so how's it faster? Well, one thing I didn't appreciate is that if you paint something within a closed environment like this, if I paint these walls, mm -hmm. it takes longer to dry versus being exposed to air all the time in like a large factory setting, things like this. Also because our permitting hasn't changed, mm -hmm. which is really the linchpin. It's not the process as much as, can I build everything within that closed system plop it down versus stop and go with permitting. And Do you think that that's our issue though? In 100%. Can Interesting. I mean, permitting. So I think two, one obviously is, is permitting for sure. I would say two would be incentivization to builders to build anything. So <clears throat> if you're looking at a build in Canada, and we can do an episode all on this to be quite honest, but I believe that 40% of total costs for a builder to build anything. So we're talking condo buildings, um, uh, uh, subdivisions, 40% is taxes, 40%. So, you know, I understand the frustration of the general public out there who, you know, sees these builders as greedy and they're trying to get every last dollar and push people to squeeze them to go over their limits and they're just trying to make money evil, evil, evil. The reality is, is that first of all, this is their business. They're allowed to make money and the city, pr province and federally right. all take a chunk of it. And, and I believe all those costs also have to do with like permits. There's a, there's a whole whack of additional things that yeah. get passed on. On top of the taxes. As if you're, yeah. yeah, absolutely. What's really, what really fascinated me about this article was that every single industry from law to accounting 
what have you, we've actually increased our productivity since 1968 per hour. So every hour worked within all those sectors, we are more productive now than we were in 1968. Except for except, the highways. Except when you do any work on a highway or street. Yes, yes of course. Sorry. Except for home builders. Home builders from 1968 to today are half as productive. Because there's too much money in it. But half I really think there's... They're less productive. But I believe because there's so much money for the levels of government to make sure that they get their piece. Oh yes, so I really do. I also, you're slowed down. So, so why are they why are they less productive per hour than the nine, in 1968? Now it's a U.S. stat, but I would imagine it's the same in Canada. You're sitting on your hands because it's, because you have to wait for this permit, that zoning approval. So now, rather than okay, I'll, I'll digress for a second, but it relates. So Amazon distribution, okay, like the delivery of stuff, mm -hmm. the, and same with garbage trucks. The biggest problem that garbage companies have is not like what kind of machine they have and what have you. No, it's actually smartly figuring out how to plot where to pick up in a way that makes sense. So right. would it make sense for me to drop off um, one package here and then, I get an, and then I'm gonna go across the city to drop off and, I, and then come back to drop off another project. Okay. You're losing tons of time, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine like uh, someone in Amazon going here, dropping off here and then coming back to the same area. The man, it just doesn't make sense. Right. So imagine now a contractor. They now have to sit on this home. This home now is like permitting done. Okay, now I get everybody else. And we gotta now move to another site because I gotta wait from here. The moving back and forth is actually extreme waste of time and resources and money. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're less productive because of that. The interest, like the, the zoning, the, all that type of stuff just makes it slower and the permitting. So I don't think, I think it's possible that we can actually meet the goals of making or building 22 million new homes in the next 10 years that would level out the affordability, blah, blah, blah. We're just not going to do it. Because to your point, a lot of people get a cut. And frankly, Ontario and Canada, our deficit is quite aggressive. There's no way that we can roll that back right now. No, and the so cities are bleeding happen. for sure. The cities are bleeding. I mean, I would also say that um, when you look at the distribution of population, most people are in, again, we talked about this in a previous episode, the majority of people are in Toronto and Vancouver. Now Montreal would be bigger, yes. yes. Montreal would be bigger if it wasn't for the language barrier. And now Calgary is the fastest growing city center um, in in Canada. Halifax was almost there. Halifax was was starting, but again, we need to make, we have so much land, okay? So at first when you said the modular, I'm like, well, where are they gonna put the, where are they gonna build? Well, we have so much land, but no one's going to the Yukon, okay? No one's, go, no one Forget wants Yukon. to live. I hate to say it, Winnipeg. Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Winnipeg. Um, like the list is much longer than just Yukon, yeah. right? Um, did, I say, did I say Edmonton? Sorry, I don't Outskirts mean anything to Yukon. Like, yeah. like there's places even out. Timmins, yeah. like just, the reality is, is that where are we going to put these people when we're letting the immigration in and we're deciding on these numbers? I mean, is there a way to make sure that we're, you know, um, allotting a certain amount that are going to each province? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, and I, I'm sure, is that if you're bringing people in um, and saying, listen, you have to have a certain amount of money, you have to have, like, I know there was at one point they were allowing certain trades in, whatever. Well, if you're saying, listen, I need electricians, right? We all know trades are all retiring. It's very hard to find trades. That's the other thing. Um, these trades don't want to go to Surrey or they don't want to go. Well, actually, they may want to go to Surrey, but they may, they don't want to go to Winnipeg yeah. or, because there's no work. There's, there's the, the population distribution is, doesn't make it feasible which is why in Canada generally, even Rogers, for example, they never provided wireless to a huge swath of Canada. The government had to fund a lot of it because why would I as Rogers spend any money putting down cable for 10 people? I'm not gonna spend that money. And so- Oh my God, don't even get me, sorry. By the way, let's not even go on a tangent and the fact that when I drive 45 minutes north to a, like a buyer visit for clients of mine who bought, a gorgeous property in Caledon. I mean, you can buy properties outside of Toronto now oh, yes. in the gazillions, okay? Five million plus, 10 million plus. There's beautiful pieces of land, gorgeous custom homes being built. There's no, there's no internet. 
Like you'll be driving and I will literally have to say, I will leaving the house, I will call you back in 40 minutes when I'm closer to Toronto. Yes. How are we ever going to build a population outside of the city center? Exactly. We haven't built a highway since what, I mean, other than the 407 that you have to pay for, was the last time we built a highway? Oh yeah, so, so exactly. I remember during COVID, a lot of people had moved out to those areas and one person told me that like one of their um, cause they had to stream and like, uh, they didn't get access to the internet. And when they did, they had to pay for the big chunk of it from Rogers. Yeah. I believe it was Rogers. They paid like for one video zoom meeting. It was like $450, like something ridiculous. And so that is going to continue to put pressure in the city as well. I'm, I'm curious. So with your buyers, where do they look and why? It really depends on budget and lifestyle. I would still tell you Let's that- Let's say they're employed. They're still living in Toronto. Yeah. They really are. And, and why though? Is it because- Well, if they're, listen, if they're, um, if they're with school age children, yep. okay. it'll be for a school district, for sure. Okay. Um, the, the family that we bought the property from had two young kids and they were getting older. And when you have small kids, yeah, they're fine to hang out with you, you know, with your daughter. You get a little bit older, they want a social life. You can't be 20 minutes from the next friend, right? right. So now you need to go to a more populated area. If you're young, it, they're, yes, they're still work from home, some kind of model, but they want to most single people, young people, they want to walk outside their house. They want to go to a bar. They want to go, you know, get onto transit. Right. So, and, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because, again, it's not just, I think you're right. It's not just build more. Location does matter, right? The old adage in real estate, location, location, location. So my next it's question is- It's still location, location, it, location. We, we, we That's never going to change. Yeah. And so we, we claim, let's build. Okay. So let's say we solve- the, the ability to build, will we build things that no one's going to move into? Meaning that if it's out in the outskirts for a 30 something year old or a 20 something year old that wants to be in the downtown core, does it really matter that I've built something that's 45 minutes from the city, no transit, and I have to commute into work? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not just build, it's where. And so unless right, Canada where becomes, are you going to build it? And unless we create what we have in Europe, which are local 15 minute cities in which I can actually fundamentally work within that smaller well, city center. Well, they're talking about those. But, but that means that the jobs have to be there. And given that Canada is so heavily weighted in the finance, so we have in the services sector, yeah. you have people that work in finance, lawyers, yeah. accountants, tech, you can work from home. Unless Canada shifts its mentality to permit work from home, or at the, I think work from home will be it, I do not think that we're going to be able to build homes that people will actually want to live in as well. And that's a key piece that nobody talks about. It's not just what, it's also where. Well, and that's why it infuriates me when the government comes out and says, you know, we have to instill this capital gains tax because we have to invest in building homes. Someone outline how you're going to build those homes before you throw that tax on. That's, that is one of the reasons that yeah. they're claiming they want the capital gains tax because we have to invest. Now I'm doing my best Christian Freeland. <laughs> I won't. Um, for all the people that like her, um, that, you know, they want to invest in, in home building right. and I'd like to see that plan. I haven't seen it. And by the way, I'd say that for any level of government. I'm sorry, whether it's it's the the Ford government, whether it's the conservative, it doesn't matter. No one has a plan. No one. It's not possible. If you look at the number, they are so behind the numbers that they already said they're building. And instead, it's take the tax off or make it again. I said it a million times. There are ways that the government can make buying a home more affordable. Take the taxes off and they're not going to. None of this is going to happen. Make it easier, incentivize builders to build. Okay? Yep. It, and you can do it. There's so many layers and so much red tape. Land transfer tax is killer. In the city of Toronto, it's double. And outside, it's still expensive, too. I had a yes. friend who just bought a home and she said to me she, she just wanted to cry. $50,000. The farther, Gone. yeah, and never mind that the farther out of Toronto you go, the higher your property taxes. Let's not yes. forget about that. Yes. People think are like, what? No. No, it's quite expensive. I know somebody who lives in 
King area. Like King no. City? Yes, a little bit, yeah, sorry, Richmond, Richmond Hill. Yeah, <laughs> Richmond. He, he pays $20,000 a year. In, in property tax. In property tax, and it's not a big home. But it's a huge piece of land. Nope. Nope. That's a lot of, are you it's sure? A, uh, yeah. Really? Yeah, and, and then the reason why I thought that was so bizarre was because I was speaking with somebody else who is moving to Dallas, well, wants to move to Dallas, can he, like Toronto, no, sorry, from India, came to Toronto, and he was just like, I'm done with Canada. Capital gains tax actually threw him over the edge. Yep. Looking at a home in Dallas, he says to me, but you know, the problem with Dallas is the private taxes are so high. I'm like, tell me more. He's like, like some of them are like $20,000. And I'm like, that's the same as, as Richmond. Then you ask him, what's your income tax? Oh, no, no. And then, and then we, when we actually sat down, it's exceptionally cheaper there. And so, yes. nonetheless, I, I- That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not, I, it's a myth that Canada is offset. Like our, our costs are offset. Well, the like, more you our, make, like, yeah. the more they take. Um, we didn't start the episode on what I'm seeing this se um, and I would tell you that I am seeing this week or I've seen in this past week where usually seasonally the market would start slowing down. Yeah. It is consistently going and what's concerning me a little and I'm not like a the sky is falling chicken little but there's a lot of listings and there are there is an increase in numbers of of like mortgage defaults and and there is there is a history that when rates get cut defaults go up and we are seeing rates get cut defaults go right up right now going into what we're seeing right now we are seeing mm -hmm, defaults on the rise now when i say that we're still in canada we still have the stress test. So when I say it's on the rise, we're talking minimally. Right. There's no question in numbers. Like you might see numbers, they're like, we're up 57%. Well, if you go six to 10, yes. But it's still, but I think we're going to see those people who are coming up for renewals starting now. Okay, so a couple of things we're gonna take a step back. So yes, I, 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 funny that you mentioned that we forgot to talk about what, what you saw this week. So I was yes. like, I'm like, we could close off on that. So if we close off on that, at least we Today we it. will. So if we could even do part two, because this needs a broader discussion, because typically June, you see things slow. I want to understand what this means, meaning that is it that people are now listing because they're desperate or is it because activity hasn't slowed or because now they see more buyers are coming out? Too early to tell. What I'll tell you is buyer activity has increased without a doubt are they doing a lot i'm not convinced so what i would like to see is when the june numbers come out and again i only have jury of one perception but um i listed a condo that i thought it was going to be dead well priced it's a good it's a good piece of property um but I've had activity on it and people would say i have said that the condo market is really tough right now right so i think um, it's too easy. It's too early to tell. I don't think that listings are flooding because people can't afford it. I think that listings are coming out because people are always late to the party. They are. So everybody, and I said it in my last newsletter out to everybody, this spring season was this hurry up and wait. Everybody was like, wait, wait. And the first rate cuts, was in June, which was very smart of the Bank of Canada because they know if they did it too early or they did it too much, that they were going to see a surge in, in real estate and home pricing, uh, home buying, and that would have hurt inflation. I think people are out as if it was March now, and I don't know if anything's really gonna come of it or whether it's just gonna kind of fizzle out because it's July. Or are we gonna have a July? Like, I don't know. Like, it's a little odd. And perhaps we'll wrap it there and do part two, because I think the big thing that we should ask is, did COVID stop seasonality? But, it did, it. but, no, but yeah. no, 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 okay, okay, pause, okay. you can't okay. talk anymore. We're okay, do bye. part two. Part two, another day. Well, well, we'll do part two in July, when the numbers come out. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, thanks.